Well, in considering my practice, what I, about a year and a half ago, I created this thing I call the identity construct because I feel that most artists um, have a personal side and they have this sort of public side that, which amounts to uh, an identity construct uh, that they uh, present to people. And, uh, well, how did I um, decide to um, create this identity uh, construct? I, I felt that, it, that as far as myself is concerned, I have a number of topics that I consider rhetorical components. And um, I'd say performative or construct personae praxis components and what I feel are um, the, the material symptoms or the, the byproducts of, of, uh, of the process of my development of, of these various ideas. Um, but off to the side here, the, the idea of, of, uh, of, say for example, like my little um, branding thing. Actually, it's interesting that you uh, asked me about whether this idea of the, uh, the construct was like a brand. No, actually, to tell you the truth, this little chunk here is um, merely the idea of sort of like the logo, the branding, that and and all that is that. Um, um, I won't go into that too too long. Uh, I think that in uh, in our context, that um, people want to want something that uh, they can identify with you very quickly, um, and uh, I only find that as a, as a necessity. So I just have this little identity construct. And then online, of course, I have all my materials. Um, um, about, I'd say really only about a third of my work is, is documented online. I need to work on that. Um, but as far as um, how I consider my prax practice, I have uh, my rhetorical components, uh, my sort of uh, performance-based performative components, and then these um, artifacts or material symptoms of uh, which are the uh, more objective um, components of the uh, of of the work, um, the things that fill my studio apartment, or, and uh, my wife complains about. Um, so, in the rhetorical components, there are the various topics, uh, various concepts that I'm interested in. Um, I have five of the major ones. There are a few others. Um, my dialogue with, um, you know, between, uh, with whether I want to work materially or not, which I call my, uh, material dialectic, the, whether, um, my ambivalence towards the art market, which I, um, I don't really concern myself so much with, uh, selling things, which is going to sit, which may seem, um, paradoxical with, um, the, uh, production strategy, but we'll, we'll go there in a minute. Um, and then on a, uh, on a, um, so this is really sort of my theoretical grounding. So some of the topics that I've either come up with or decided to work with are the things that concern me, uh, whether I want to work with them or not. And I'm saying that I'm not necessarily a proponent of these things. They're the things that, that, um, I look at in a, in a critical fashion, um, that, um, I don't really have any, um, that I don't dismiss nor um, promote. Uh, there are things that I'm actually just much more interested in than anything else uh, that give me this uh, a sort of um, discomfort, which of course drives my work. Um, then in the the idea of what I call praxis components, um, I'd say that they're really the uh, the performance based components that that drive my work. Um, Say for example, like um, the the work in creating um, activist work um, with various people, uh, video the gr video graffiti work that um, came out of Haymarket Riot, but then also crystallized through um, working with Guillermo Gomez Pena. Uh, daily performance. Uh, the idea was that um, at one point or another, I'm in many ways I merely thought uh, felt that I was just. Um, for a couple of years, I felt that I was, uh, uh, as an artist, I was merely um, presenting a persona to the public. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd, I'd do something on a every or every other daily basis to try to a um, 
maybe do a little daily performance or uh, keep myself from being bored. Um, I don't know. Um, and also, since I have scholarship criticism, editing, and curation, uh, since I consider myself a um, media-based theorist, um, that the thought uh, creates the practice, then creates the then creates the work. I think that's a really good point. The thought creates the practice that creates the work. Um, and I think that's really indicative of my process. Um, but um, a, a scholarly and critical thought and the creation of curatorial projects and also um, putting together uh, publications and such, I think are um, really important to um, informing my work. And then down through here, uh, the idea of the material symptoms are, um, I'd say are just the results of the process, which I, a uh, process of um, exploration, which I think is as much part and parcel of my work as the, anything that is either media or objectified in any manner. Um, so this may sound a little confusing at times that um, the, uh, well, along the lines of now, in other words, the, the artist's journey is a work of art, you know, the, the artist's life is a, as, as uh, part of the artistic process as much as the production of any, any particular, particular item, um, I think is, is extremely important and I think is um, something that's very indicative of, of what I do. So, um, all, in, all in all, um, I'm still developing this, this whole idea, but, uh, um, and, um, but uh, it, it was very interesting that up until about two, three years ago, I hadn't thought of, um, I had been working in so many different areas on so many different things. When I was challenged with the idea of creating a holistic structure for my practice, uh, I was flabbergasted, and uh, it was really interesting to come up with something like and come up with mm -hmm. something like this. I I believe that um, context and location are everything. But um, and a, as a conceptualist, as a media-based theorist, um, it's um, I understand that I let a concept drive the media, drive the drive the subject, um, but. Um, so much of my work is involved with, um, you know, a very specific time, place, concept, location, um, that, um, it can be so context specific that it can be sometimes, um, hard to read. In general, um, I th think that I can only expect people to, um, at any one time, get uh, derived meaning from, um, I'd say the time, place, and context mm -hmm. that any one piece is being shown at any one time with what short statement I give them. And then if they're interested, then they can go and go back into the other work and then try to unfold, you know, uh, the, the larger context mm -hmm. from, uh, from my work. As someone who's, um, hasn't really concerned himself very much as far uh, in regards to the sale of work mm -hmm. and has often worked uh, for a number of years between about 1996 and 2000 I worked entirely in media so I didn't have any um, any material uh, products at almost at all between during that that four years it might seem ironic in that uh, someone who also questions the idea of capitalism at a fundamental level is, concerns himself with production strategies, but um, at one point or another I had to really sort of reconcile myself with the idea of what would I do, uh, how would I keep myself sane if I did engage in a production strategy. So I came up with this sort of, um, this sort of nested um, strategy for production. In other words, um, from the precious, the unique, the mass, to the extemporaneous and the ephemeral, um, one of the things that um, I've been trying to think about as a, a more traditional artist and less um, of um, 
you know, the, the purely conceptual is how does someone who works in media, in um, digital forms, which often um, don't have an archival form, um, work in um, work in ways that uh, can build bridges between build bridges with the uh, uh, with the traditional uh, Western art practice. And I said, okay, well, as far as I'm concerned, this is sort of a a, a continuum uh, between um, what I would say the more the more avant garde to the much more traditional. To say, for example, um, doing uh, performance-based, conceptual-based uh, activist work, uh, and so on, uh, net-based work, which I really don't feel um, it has much um, basis in archival um, installation work, which in many cases is uh, ephemeral in nature by default, and uh, interactive work, which isn't necessarily. Uh, new, I should probably say interactive and new media. Um, new media, um, because I feel that in general it's either it's either on it's either on the spot or ephemeral, and then you start getting into the more um, material and objective uh, work, such as. Um, you know, mass print, litho, DVD, CD. Um, let's, I mean, let's, let's face it, for one, uh, for, uh, for one function or another, there, um, if you've done a video, sometimes people want to be able to have an archive of it. Um, if you've done uh, a piece of music, sometimes people want to have a, you know, want to have a, uh, a CD. Um, so there's, um, you know, there's, there's the idea of having uh, large quantities of low-cost pieces. Um, unique works. There was one point where I had thought about, um, what if you have something, an interactive piece that someone might actually want an object? Um, well, in my VR work, um, I thought about the idea of saying, well, if somebody wanted to have um, a memento of, well, it's, that's, that sounds really, uh, that sounds really kitschy, um, but um, if they wanted to have a piece that represented part of their experience from a VR piece, uh, I said, okay, great. So as they're going through, we'd sit down and say, okay, at this point, boom, let's get the screen grab, and then, of course, then... Um, it would either to be a, a, a print or an oil um, from a, and then of course this comes down to the one a, one of a kind um, the, the the precious work that takes a great deal of time to produce um, such as traditional sculpture electronic pieces which uh, of course take is very labor intensive um, you know traditional works to traditional oils mm -hmm. traditional prints drawings etc um, I think that while on one hand, um, a lot of um, the people who I've, I've, I've worked with may or may not um, consider um, the idea of creating more traditional works um, interesting or not, and I, I have a very clear ambivalence with it, uh, I, just, I just wonder, almost as a, uh, as a thought experiment, how someone who works in media would create an obje a, a, um, an objective practice um, through various means. And this is what I came up with. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm really much more um, involved with doing the writing and um, showing things in a more media in, in a in a media form than. Um, Really, can, really being too worried about doing gallery shows and such, um, I really just don't have the space for it uh, at the moment, really. Um, and I don't think that the, it's something that um, really um, articulates the things that I want to do um, as, as well as anything, but I think that this was actually an interesting um, thought experiment to consider how a media artist would possibly um, have a type
top to bottom um, art production strategy if they chose to. So there you are. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I think there's, um, I've always had a sense of social justice mm -hmm. um, that has uh, a sense of social justice which um, also intersected with having had, um, I, I think that we all have some injustices done to us in our, in, in our lives and I think that I would like to see um, them, other people not have to have to deal with them at some point or another. But also, on the other hand, having uh, been part of a community and that has been so involved in, in things like democracy, social justice, uh, activism, criticism. Um, I'm also trying to reconcile myself with um, this formalist sort of bent that I'm going into. But then I think on the other hand, um, but I think that this isn't so far out of line with um, considering the history of the culture in which I'm involved. Uh, the idea that um, Considering the history of technological culture as something that um, a culture that has been considered as um, in a modernist sense, you know, something that was always going to save us, but I think in many ways has has failed to do so. But we still keep going back to it for answers. So my looking at things like the the, the Western art tradition in regards to art and technology and it, the interface in it, and also looking at these historical themes that I'm starting to look at and that I'm starting to consider now, I don't think that they're um, a turning away uh, from uh, from activism. I think that they're probably a much more subtle consideration of social issues and cultural issues at at, at larger scales that aren't maybe necessarily so um, directly um, applied in, in the streets, but I, I think that they're important to consider because I think that they may be looking at much larger issues that may still have a great deal of impact. Mm -hmm. So how does the audience play in that? I mean, with the activist role, obviously, you have a certain audience that is surprised maybe or that isn't expecting um, for you to be entering into that setting but within the art community within creating objects you have an audience that is already potentially on your side mm -hmm. and um so it you're not exactly you're not reaching that cathartic state maybe with a new crowd with with a right. surprise but is it maybe reaching a more important or a more pointed audience in some way Maybe so. I think I think reflection is important. Mm -hmm. I think reflection is is important. I think that reflection is important within a culture that has um, historically had such a lack of reflection. Mm -hmm. I think technological culture, in many ways, felt that it was unique in that it somehow uh, represented some sort of a, of a, an end of history. The the an end of historical notes were so different. Were so. Um, uh, atypical that we somehow have um, transcended a sense of history which is complete and utter baller dash. Um, it's um, it's it's as historical it's as historical as anything else. Um, but uh, and I think we're starting to see this. So in so doing, as someone who's been involved in activism and scholarship and also, I think that scholarship is now taking maybe a historical term in looking at how all these things negotiate with one another through things like um, the, the art world practice versus the um, sort of si the situationist activist flexus data practice. Um, you know, this is, I'm in a period of flux at this point and uh, I'm considering all these things. I'm not saying that I agree, even agree with myself at any one point or another, and some other some of my colleagues may not agree with me for taking some of the turns that I'm taking. That that I'm taking, in other words, considering things like the object or questioning the idea of whether the object may be saleable. Um, I think it's. I think it's a. I, I think it's. 
I, a, um, I, I think it's a, um, a consideration. I think it's a consideration of history. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny that right at the moment I'm feeling a little bit of a cold chill come up in my spine. Is considering the idea of galleries and objects and things like that. I think that's very important in regards to um, my own history because of the fact that this is this was something that I considered so anathema. You know, and now I'm actually consider considering these things, but I think it, I'm, I'm most definitely at least ambivalent towards it. Um, here's a good point. My ambivalence towards galleries and my previous practice, etc., I think it's looking at practice as a laboratory. I think it's the idea of critically engaging with my subjects through doing various things as maybe you know, as, as a series of experiments to try to learn more about certain aspects of culture or what things are effective or not effective or um, you know whether um, I you know whether things have more or less voice here there or someplace else given a context and location um, you know there there are times in which um, um, you know, a, uh, a conceptual situationist um, activist, uh, um, bent, you know, has, you know, really considered, well, you know, you, you know, you, you're, you're to question the gallery, uh, you're to question the museum, you're to question the institution, and I believe in that a great deal, but also, on the other hand, I'm, I'm also maybe learning for myself a little bit you know my own reasons for why I may want to consider uh, I may want to question um, various institutions, um, historical, institutional, etc. Um, it's 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 a little it's it's a little part of the journey. Look closer. Look closer. Under close vision there exists no background, plane, concrete or frame of reference. The relationship of the part to the whole is consistently questioned, resulting in considerable dislocation. Under such an assumption, scale distorts and references disappear, leaving a landscape of uncertain origin. At 10 centimeters away, the world simultaneously falls apart and unfolds. Funny that from far away that people look like ants, but from up close, ants look like people, and act like them, too. Or these ants, or people. Or these ants, or people. Ants, people. Ants, people. Ants, people. I can never tell. Actually, it looks more like modern art to me. Just about everything looks like modern art when you look at it through a camera from six inches away. Even a grocery store statue of Jack Daniels assumes great stature if you get close enough. What does this mean? I have no more idea than you do, except there's a point here somewhere. It's rather ironic that someone thought that this bench of us was the World Trade Center. I think nowadays if you look close enough, you can see anything in anything else, like the Holy Virgin in my cat's fur. I'm sure that somewhere in rural Montana that someone is obsessively sculpting the World Trade Center in mashed potatoes like Richard Dreyfuss in Close Encounters. But that's the way things are now. If you look closely enough you can see almost anything. Except for clouds. If you get too close to them, they disappear. Much like when you climb a mountain, the thing you see when you reach the summit is where the next one lies. The large tends to disappear when you get too close, and the small becomes monumental. Perhaps that's where the whole business with the mohill came from. Or in this case, perhaps an ant hill. At these perspectives, a stick from an ice cream bar can be a cenotaph, and the ant hill is a suitable location for a ski resort. Texts become monuments, and dominoes become monoliths. But combining computers with monoliths usually results with computers that won't let you back in the house. Open the garage door, pal. I am afraid I can't do that. Oh, come on. Please. Please, please, please. No freaking way. See what I mean? When you look at increasing levels of detail, reality resembles itself from planets to atoms, to varying levels of code. 
the fractal nature of existence becomes evident. Strange thing that even at 5 inches tall, I still look roughly the same. It's just a matter of perspective. Reality can transform when your point of view changes. The sense of the world is so fragile that it can dissolve when one gets a bit closer. Sans people. Sans people. Sans people. I can never tell. A wrist full of bits. Time. Still. Watching. I'm still blind. I have seen the world from my wrist for too long. My identity seems like it's reduced to a wrist full of bits. All I am sure of now is my face on a screen. Robot dinosaurs. And chocolate donuts. Little chocolate donuts. Welcome to the dessert of the real. The French theorist Han Barthelard once wrote on simulated culture. He wrote, To dissimulate is to feign not to have what one has. To simulate is to feign to have what one hasn't. Like dinosaurs. Big robotic dinosaurs. This is a story about the evolution and extinction of animatronic dinosaurs and how the world was saved by performance artist Holly Hughes. When I was a child, I was scared of mechanical animals. Their lifeless metal eyes would pierce my very soul. I knew they'd be more trouble than real animals. But then, what's more real? Animals made of bits of metal or bits of data. She doesn't bloody well care. All she wants is bits in her bowl. It all started with little mechanisms that look like roaches. That's why you can't kill them anymore. But they evolved into cute robotic dogs and wind up chicks. That's what it was like for a long time. But why were yeah, they here? Yeah. It all has to do with technology's agendas of obsolescence. The goal is the elimination of labor, death, hunger and promotion of maximum productivity. In short, the obsolescence of humanity. That's why you never see real people in Victoria's Secret Acts. Mainly because they can't exist there. Did I mention little chocolate donuts? Of course, some of them would grow up innocently enough as little robotic chicks and spend their lives in vending machines. However, there were those who were different. These were the freaks. The ones who did not conform to assembly line tactics. Often enough they would be sold into white meat slavery to Texas fried chicken stands run by former avatars of the subgenies movement. That's when it started to get weird. I mean it just got wrong. They began to mutate into things that were never intended by nature of Walt Disney. They grew into things like big robotic dinosaurs that lived in shopping malls. They were harmless enough, but when you least expect it, pow, there goes an arm. So something had to be done. Of course, American shopping malls are surreal enough. But this was getting out of hand. One bit, two bits, three bits a little. When you want more bits, he's not good at little. We couldn't use nukes because the science said so. We went to check the meals, but all we got was a hack of random lousy plastic statue. So much for the real. The postmodern is a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. You can't get any service, and the trains don't run on time. Holly Hughes had plenty of experience with fighting dinosaurs, but she'd have to think about it. So we were left with malls populated with these stupid simulated dinosaurs. There was one thing left. Little chocolate donuts. I love it when it does that. That's the problem with technology, because it can be done doesn't mean it should. But no, we had to let aliens and scientists go and create these monstrosities. But Holly had a plan. She would send Trojan chickens full of bits of little chocolate donuts and feed them to the dinosaurs. The viral reaction would cause localized distortions in the plot structure and cause their extinction. And it worked. Suddenly they were gone and shopping resumed. A monument was erected in Manhattan in her honor. So, was any of this real? Just as real as anything on TV or CNN. It's tough to be objective when your reality derives from a wrist full of bits. There is one thing I'm sure of, though. Little chocolate donuts. 